uh, Karen and Don for donating fancy stuff uh, to get more money out I of us. I need to look into that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly. We're like, Wah. and um, so we have a fundraiser going on for the design residency. We have a few more days on this, and we're uh, really well there. So thank you all for giving to that. Um, Don and Karen's show is still going on at the Kennedy, which and it's wonderful. So do please go see. It's incredibly important, um, and it's good for the rest of the university to see that design matters, and it's not just stuff to look at it, stuff that actually functions. And that Don and Karen actually know what they're doing. That's how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so now to Michael. And Michael uh, had a, he first had a drawing class with Don, and then he ended his education with uh, advanced laser cut letterpress forms with Mark. So he's showing how you can take an idea and expand it and expand it and expand it. And uh, apparently you were known for not sleeping, Michael. We look forward to hearing about that. Oh, yes. That. Oh, I yeah. mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we'd really like to hear about how Michael uses his OU education. And this is a chance for you to pick his brain, find out what he does, why he does it, and what tips that he can give you. And it's more than just what advice can you give me? It's Think about specific things like are you what it what kind of information can would he does he wish he would have he would have had so so when you're asking your questions just try to be more specific and uh, we'll get as much information as we can out of him. All right, and with that I'm going to hush Michael and I'm going to leave it up to you and I'll tell people you all don't have to have your videos on while he's talking, but we will have a discussion at the end of his presentation and that's when I would like you for you to turn on your your faces, your lovely faces. Okay, thank you Michael and here you go. Cool, thanks. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, okay. Everyone can see my screen. Mm -hmm. OK, so basically I'm just going to give kind of a synopsis of some stories about myself and uh, how I got to OU and essentially where I, I've ended up now. OK, um, so I think it's pretty clear at this point, but um, I'm Michael Young. Uh, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm 28 years old. I transferred to OU in 2012. I graduated in 2016. I currently live and work out of a two bedroom apartment in Brooklyn, New York. I am a digital product designer. Um, this is kind of the, the part where I, I know this might not make a lot of sense, but I'm hoping at the end of this, we can dig into what I do and what this means. Um, but most of my experience as a digital product designer is um, being in e-commerce. I currently work at a sleep company called Casper. Um, we sell products like mattresses, bedding, furniture, both online and in stores all over North America. And I also freelance for a nonprofit called Give Directly, um, which directly transfers uh, cash from donors all over the world to individuals living in extreme poverty. Um, and yeah, so today I'm just kind of go through some stories um, about my time at OU, a little bit time before that, and essentially uh, how I got to where I am now. OK, so first going to um, jump back to 2010. So I was a completely average student. Um, I pretty much abandoned every sport I ever tried, and my only marketable skills at this point in time were playing the drums and taking photos. Uh, and so I went to Notre Dame College in South Euclid, Ohio um, on a marching band scholarship in pursuit <laughs> of photography. <laughs> um, this is actually me and my best friend, Abby. We met at Notre Dame, but, um, you know, this is this is a typical typical weekend. If you're on a marching band scholarship, you spend most of your time at football games um, and competitions. Uh, and yeah, so in my free time, I, I spent a lot of time taking photos, and that's also what I was studying at the time. Um, here are a few portraits I, I took mostly for fun around that time. 
This is Kelly. She's actually my roommate right now. We've known each other since high school. Um, this is Tori and this is Dan. So I, I guess I'm starting with photography because it's kind of like the jumping off point for me into, into design. And what I liked about photography was how malleable images are. Um, I mean, that being said, I, I wasn't a very good uh, photographer, um, especially without Photoshop. Um, I relied on combining like, you know, three, four, five images together, uh, basically to edit my way out of things. Um, and I mean, ultimately during my time at Notre Dame, I learned that like, I, I had an interest in, in music, but I, I had no interest in pursuing it beyond the free tuition. And although I liked photography, um, I preferred watching Photoshop tutorials to going to photography class. For me, it was all about the edit. I felt like uh, th there were no new stories for me to tell with photography, and it was kind of just an exploration in craft. Okay, so fast forwarding a bit to uh, 2012. So I this is when I transferred to OU. Essentially, uh, I started I started over as a freshman in order to apply for the program. I think there were 40, 40 of us maybe pursuing roughly 20 spots in graphic design. Uh, actually, yeah, here I have some some type studies. I, I pulled these from my sophomore portfolio. And honestly, it was around this time that I fell in love with typography, you know, uh, physical type, digital type, uh, the rules, the theories, the history. I, I This was the first time I finally felt like I found something that made me tick. Um, that, I mean, that being said, you know, this this was like an aha moment, but I still struggled even after getting into the program. I struggled to feel creative or, or feel like I had any new ideas or, or a story to tell. Um, and then <laughs> I guess to the point about me not sleeping is I, I developed a lot of bad habits. Um, I was working at all hours of the night, often not even working at all, just trying to find like momentum somewhere to start. And that was one of my biggest worries going into junior and senior year was, you know, how can I how can I sustain this if I'm if I have to do all my work in the middle of the night like this? This isn't this is not how the world works once you graduate. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so jumping forward to 2015, um, this is the summer before my senior year. And I got an internship at a small design studio called Alexander Design Associates in midtown manhattan um i mean this kind of just fell into my plate out of looking for my next internship um and i really didn't have a plan i i found my apartment on craigslist i skyped with the girl who listed it and a few weeks later i moved to brooklyn for the summer uh, yeah i have a few projects here from from that time but um yeah, essentially what I what I did at ADA was a lot of the things that I was used to doing in, in the classroom. So like typesetting and, you know, like exporting things for print. Um, this this was one of my big projects. It was a sustainability report for MetLife. And I also redid some labels for the Eaton Corporation. And I, I had an internship before this one um, at a software company in Cleveland. But this this time was my first my first time working in a studio setting, designing for multiple clients. And I mean, for obvious reasons, I wasn't crazy about insurance or gear lubricant. But what I realized at the time is this this didn't matter. Like um, what I actually cared about was collaboration. Um, I, I wanted to work with copywriters. I wanted to work with product managers. I wanted to you know, be exposed to other creatives and, and kind of like cross pollinate. Uh, that, that being said, I also, because I didn't fully enjoy uh, the work, I also pushed my luck a bit near the end. I was late to work often. And, <laughs> you know, as someone who lives in New York, you can only blame the G train so many times before you look like an asshole. And <laughs> near the end of my 
internship, one of the partners pulled me aside and he said something along the lines of, I'm one of the nicer guys to work for. There aren't a lot of us out there. Um, like you always need to show up. Being talented will only get you so far. And I mean, that that stuck with me. That was kind of a big wake up call of like, wow, I just disappointed somebody and I disappointed myself. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, good, good learning experience. <laughs> okay, so when I got back to Athens, uh, I mean, this is, this is around 2016. Uh, like everyone else at the time, I was heads down on my thesis and planning a way to get back to New York. Uh, here are actually a few sketches um, of my thesis or, or some photos of it. And in a nutshell, I, I cleared out some old type cabinets. Here's just some sketches of them. And I laser cut uh, two weights of Adrian Frutiger's Frutiger into type high maple. And I printed those blocks of wood type uh, with the platen, which is that press right there, during the exhibition. Uh, thesis was was challenging, I think, for a lot of you know for a lot of different reasons. But I think sometimes creating for yourself is excruciating. You know, there's there's no boundaries. Uh, what you make essentially reflects your imagination and your skills. And honestly, I felt like I had nowhere to hide. Like, you know, I, this was my idea and basically on a stage for people to critique. And I think a lot of us felt this way or a lot of us feel this way about critique or, or even about thesis. And especially when you're working without a prompt or a brief for an entire year, it can be kind of terrifying. And I think even like even now, I'm not sure what to make of my thesis other than it was it was just a love letter to tech and typography. And I think it also helped me realize that the key to making it outside of this program is finding your own way of applying the foundation of knowledge we learn in our studio classes. And I think the other like main point I want to make is that it doesn't really matter what industry you're in or you care about. Design thinking is pretty much relevant anywhere you go. And I think like if somebody kind of would have like shook me and told me that at this time I probably wouldn't have I probably would have slept a lot more <laughs> to be honest <laughs> um okay so I'm gonna yeah fast forward a little bit to graduation yay and uh I guess like to recap like I I really had no clue what my thesis meant or even how it applied to the job market but what I did know is I wanted to go back to NYC uh, this is me and Nasra, and we put together our leftover grant money. We bought tickets to a conference about typography at the Cooper Union. We sent emails to every OUGD grad Don and Cherry could name, and <laughs> we drove to Brooklyn. Um, and I talked to Nasra quite a few times about this presentation, and when I asked her what I should say about this moment, um, she she said, quote, none of this was on the syllabus. <laughs> and I think that's like a, a pretty good summary of of what you should do after graduation is, you know, lean, lean into the momentum that you have right now and uh, make a plan. It might take a while, but if you want to get somewhere, essentially you should find someone who's already done it and try to meet them. Um, I mean, pretty much this is what I did to get to New York. Uh, after after this trip to the Cooper Union and, and to New York, I, I sold my 2003 Honda Civic and officially moved to Brooklyn. This was my, my first like real apartment um, that I was subletting in a room with like, or in a brownstone with like five other guys. And I, I essentially came here with like two months of rent and one interview like lined up. And my goal is just to see what I could make work within that time. And within within the first couple of weeks of being here, I, I had an internship like. I interviewed, I, you know, was 
was allowed to work there. And then I just started going with kind of the flow of whatever was in front of me. I'm, I'm going to just take it and run. And so this was at the time, uh, this was my first time like doing design work that I had never done before. And that that challenge in, in and of itself was, I don't know, it, it kept me feeling like I was learning. And I was, uh, this time what I was doing was, I was a motion designer uh, making Facebook video ads for a Swedish e-commerce startup called Ticktail. I didn't know anything about e-commerce, um, but I did pass Mark's studio course about motion design. And <laughs> I think like all of us who took that class, learned how to love a good After Effects tutorial. <laughs> and so just to kind of like frame what Ticktail is and 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 how I got there, but uh, Ticktail is or was um, 60, 60 people in late 2016, um, 20 people in New York City and 40 in Sweden. This is pretty much just a screenshot of our mobile homepage. Um, and that's our storefront in the Lower East Side. Here's an ad I made. And I'm essentially what I was doing was just like making quick ads, uh, helping with like landing pages. I, I was basically doing like whatever they threw at me, but the gist of it was After Effects. And again, to kind of frame what we did, essentially we built commerce tools so indie brands from all over the world could sell things online. And I guess to sum that up, it's kind of like the uh, the European version of Etsy, a little bit more elevated. But I think the long long story short here is like very few startups make money, and when they do, it often takes a very long time. So I was there for about two years, and I survived a few rounds of layoffs, and and eventually, you know, went from being an intern to a full time employee. And I think during that time, I made a lot of things. I made, you know, packaging. I, I helped uh, get billboards to print. I started doing landing pages. I was still doing After Effects. Um, and with there being less of us because of budget concerns, I, I sort of became the one-stop shop for all things brand design. <laughs> and I was missing what I, what I, was, what I loved before, which was the collaboration. And I think this is around 2017, but I, I pitched the idea of working for a few weeks in our Stockholm office. I think I have like a, an image of that, yeah. Um, because I wanted to work alongside the core team of product designers and developers who actually built our website and the app. And I mean, sadly, around this time, uh, Ticktail was bought by Shopify, which is a, a very large e-commerce platform, which essentially does the same thing. It gives tools to people to sell things online. And at this time, I, I declined my Shopify offer um, because it was a brand role in Toronto, Canada, because I wanted to stay in New York. And I, I kind of took this point to step away from brand and pursue product design. And I mean, that's pretty much where I am today is in 2019, I joined Casper. Um, and I guess from there, I, I kind of did the same thing that I did when I first started doing motion design. I just, I figured it out. I learned from the people around me. I think I did like one uh, eight hour workshop and I kind of just rolled with it. And now at Casper, essentially what I do from a day-to-day -day basis is maintain uh, our website and work again with a, a variety of designers, uh, product managers, and copywriters uh, to basically run uh, Casper.com. And so, I mean, I, I guess this is kind of the point where I, I wanted to be a little bit more open and, and we can talk actively about like what is digital product design, what is Casper. Um, I guess like what what maybe I can do is just frame what product design is. And to me, when I when I started at Ticktail, I didn't even realize that like 
ticktail.com and our, our app was a digital product. It was this living, breathing thing. And I mean, product design in itself is a sum up term. I, I tried to like write a little summary here, but essentially as a product designer, a, a digital product designer, you, you create the look and feel of something of the website, you decide how it should work, how it should function. And ultimately you're driven by whether it works, if it meets the needs of the business and if it meets the needs of the customers. And uh, it's essentially continuous iteration on the foundation of that product. Mm -hmm. And so here's just kind of like a screenshot of what I do. Um, I think I actually could exit this part of the presentation, but you know, this is, this is ticktail.com and um, what, what I do on a daily basis is design portions of our site to scale for a growing e-commerce business. You know, we, we sell a range of mattresses um, and it's my job to design these experiences, not only for, you know, the, the purpose of sale, but for the purpose of uh, people learning about sleep, people learning about product, people um, people who are looking for a specific thing and doing this, you know, in, in a digital form. Uh, it's, you know, it's essentially walking into a, a storefront. This is your retail store, basically, right? The, 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 the website. Uh, Produce yeah, so... So Casper is, I mean, we sell products essentially all over North America. We used to sell also in Europe, but we have, I think, 60 or 70 stores, Casper stores. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think right here, like this is kind of a, a shot of one of our, our stores on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we have 60 to 70, I think, retail Casper stores around America. I think there might be one or two in Canada as well, but we also sell in Target. We sell, um, I mean, pretty much anywhere you can buy a mattress now, like Raymore and Flanagan, uh, yeah, Costco. Um, we, we sell Casper products, but most of our revenue or most of our business, because we started as an e-commerce business, basically selling one mattress in a box, um, most of our business is, is through the website. Mm -hmm. So are you getting more sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I mean, we are a sleep company, but you know, uh, we, are, we are still a small team. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> oh. Okay, let me see if I can stop sharing my screen. Okay, I think that worked. Uh, but yeah, I guess like, you know, I'm here to talk about what I do further. Um, I can kind of even like break down what a, what the difference is between a digital product designer and like a web designer, if people want. Um, I think that's kind of like up to you guys. Yeah, I, I think like that would be, yeah. Go Good. Ahead. I should do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah so okay. Let me share my screen one more time because I, I do have a little slide about this. Okay. Everyone can see this, right? Yeah. Okay. So, in a very general sense, um, the difference between a product and a website is how it's used and. I mean, this is kind of just my own definition, so it might not be exact, but um, I, I think of a product or a digital product like a tool. It's something um, that someone uses over and over to complete a task. And so some things I've kind of framed here would be like, I want to share a picture with friends. Um, Instagram, Instagram is a very famous digital product. Uh, I want to make a playlist of 90s pop, Spotify, also a digital product. I want to find a pillow and ship it to my house. And I just put e-commerce here because uh, essentially a lot of e-commerce sites or uh, things that sell things 
people that sell things on the internet function in a in a very similar way where your product is the physical thing, um, but your product is also the the digital storefront that people use to check out. And I think about a website more like a digital flyer, which you know also people spend a lot of time designing. Um, and it's, but it's different in the sense that it's some something primarily informational or consumed. And so here's again, like my scenarios of like what's on view at the Brooklyn Museum. And so the Brooklyn Museum may be like store page or like not store page, but um, you know, information page is an example of like, maybe someone did like the general web design of like how the look and feel of the Brooklyn Museum might look. Um, but the actual product of Brooklyn Museum is if they're selling art and selling things online and people need to like check out or buy tickets, um, that kind of puts you more in the realm of like, this is no longer a website. We need, we, we need like engineers. We need a lot of people to kind of keep that uh, system afloat. The next thing is like, you want to see my portfolio. Um, you know, portfolio website is another example, like uh squarespace is a digital product but like your individual website um is kind of just a website and kind of my last like new york fun thing is you know you rely on a lot of websites to get information but they're not essentially products so like is the is the l train running um and like checking that status uh is kind of a dead end you go there you read the status you close the, the page and so yeah that's <laughs> That's my summary of <laughs> a web verse. Um, okay, so we can open it for, um, for questions. If you all, you can type in your question into the chat um, and then Michael can see it that way, or you can start talking if you want. You can even, um, yeah, you can even raise your hand, which is, you know, high level tech now. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Jesse. Hey, Michael. Um, so I'm a former grad of uh, the design program at OU. 2004 now, dating myself <laughs> there. Um, I'm curious. Uh, I know, like, my team is working completely remotely now, um, and we have a reasonably large sized team. I'm curious how that has changed your process. Um, I've been asking this of all my design friends, how this has changed your process within Casper, um, both in terms of just your personal design process and then also collaboration. Yeah, so I mean, I guess to, to first give a little bit more context as to Casper, I mean, we are a, a retail company, so there's a lot of employees. Um, some of those people are actually employees of the store or of CX, you know, customer service. But the, the core group that builds Casper.com, that designs the mattresses, designs the products, and, you know, does marketing, all of those things, or builds the website, like my team, is I think about like 150, maybe 200 people. And my core team, or the team that I'm on, which kind of is split between two things I'm, I'm on like the digital and tech side but also under marketing and being on the digital side like most of my workflow is um, working with pms or you know product managers who kind of look at the, the pipeline of like what features do we need to release what products are we launching what what do we need to change about casper.com to sell different products and that being said the other part of my work is working with engineers. So like specking designs for them to build it, fit and finishing things before they go live on the site and, you know, QAing and testing the site to make sure it works and people can check out and do all of those things. And then analytics of like, does it perform? Is conversion okay? Uh, like how, how do we do things to like uh, keep having the best business we can? And so my team, which is, again, not really under marketing or not really under a lot of the other umbrellas of like designing the physical product. We're a digital first team. And so it, 
being pretty flexible in the terms of like you can work from home or a lot of developers, software developers work from home at least once a week. And so I think we're very like used to this in in a lot of ways. And yeah, going fully remote at one point was was completely normal for us. Um, and so I know that's super difficult for a lot of other teams, specifically our team in San Francisco who designs the product, like not being in your studio space to like test different materials is crippling, right? Like how do you release a new version of Sheets if you can't, uh, if you can't test it? <laughs> if like you, you, you can't work with the ergonomist or like you can't work with the people who, who make that product real. Yeah. Thanks. So for me, I've, I've been very lucky in, in that sense. So Michael, how you talk about collaboration as being really important to you. How do you make sure that you're good at it or that you aren't pissing other people off or because you're in a, a team environment and it's a multi location team, not just with the lockdown, but with different teams of people in different places. Um, what is it you would suggest to students um, for being a professional collaborator? I think the the best part or the the best advice I could give about being a professional collaborator is getting to know the the struggles of someone else's role or what they do or like having some empathy at least for that. Like I I don't we don't have copywriters on our team. They fall under the marketing umbrella and so like because they have different constraints than us you know you have to you have to do a lot of like uh you have to do a lot of work to just understand what what is this person's working style what are they used to how do how do you how do they work over in marketing versus like how do we work over here and i think like honestly i i found that like the relationship you have with with people that you collaborate is important you know like i get it it's work and there's um you know, there's a lot of things going on or like you might not even know somebody and you have to share, you know, a design with them or, or share information with them. But like, I think being as empathetic to maybe someone not knowing what you do and vice versa, not knowing what they do is kind of a key part of just like being a, I guess, successful professional. I, you know, still work in progress over here on that, I, I'd say. <laughs> Thank you. Other people, jump in. This is a discussion, not a lecture. <laughs> I have a question. I'll, I'll raise my hand. I, I'm, um, I'm a 1972 graduate from the School of <laughs> Architecture, Design and Planning. Uh, my name is Robin Smith. I have a question about, about your department. Did you build this department or did it exist and you moved into it and moved up the ranks? Because it's, I, I, I love the fact that this exists. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's a good question. I definitely did not, um, <laughs> I did not start this. You know, I, I'm, I'm very much a, a small piece of the puzzle, is even on my team. Um, Casper, I think was founded, I'm not even sure what, what year exactly we were founded, but like, you know, we went from a few guys who had an idea about like selling a mattress online to essentially a, a billion dollar startup. And, you know, I kind of came at the tail end of that, of the startup phase. And so when we started to like really build out our e-com team and like think about how Casper.com is going to scale to multiple products and to like multiple stores, you know, we, we have an environments team that like designs the stores. Excuse you know, we essentially do the same thing. Michael, Michael, your video is off. Can you turn your video back on? Oh. Better? On, off? Do you all see his face? Yeah. Oh, oh it, well. Okay, it went off with mine. It was personal. So I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm so sorry. No, you're totally fine. Um, but yeah, that being said, you know, I joined a small team in terms of the people who worked on the site, but small team in, in the sense that there's maybe five or six designers, but 30, 40 uh, developers or, or engineers building the platform, you know, to sell to millions of people online mm -hmm. and ship products all over America. 
on the other hand, Ticktail, you you really uh, created uh, that that organization at the end in a sense that you were hired um, as an intern, but you were running it pretty much at the end. Is that correct? I mean, yes, yeah, similar, similar sense. Like I, I joined a small team and a lot of the framework was there, but you know, because of the nature of startups, the, the kind of two or three designers that kicked off a lot of at least the brand um, once they moved on, you know, it was essentially up to me to make all the decisions. And right. I was even making some of those decisions as an intern. Like it, it took a little bit for me to be hired full time. And um, I think like some of the experiences I had at OU specifically, like, you know, doing uh, a motion design class and then doing, um, you know, letterpress, those, the, 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 I guess, juxtaposition of those two things is essentially what I had to do at Ticktail. Like I had to design things for the web, but I also had to design tags and packaging for our, for our store. And I think that was like the beauty of that job for me is like, I get to go to the physical store. I get to like print things out. I get to like, I get to put typography on the wall. You know, I get to like do all of these physical things that I love but I also get to like reshape the way the brand looks in a digital sense, because that's how the majority of our customers will experience it. Go ahead, Nasra. Y'all jump in. Hi, I'm Nasra. I'm also class of 2016. Um, what is your favorite digital product right now? Um, OK, so this is actually a question uh, me and one of my my old coworkers. We usually ask this to people when we're hiring or when we're interviewing. And I mean, again, a lot of people come into digital product or like product design or web design through graphic design, right? Through like I was a student and I studied VizCom or something. And I usually use this question as like a kind of a gauge of like, how, how in tune are you with like the field? And so like for me, when I think of digital products, like, you know, an app, whatever, so many things. And for me right now, my favorite, which is, which is an app is actually the wallet app on, on iOS, on iPhone. Um, I have an Apple card. And so like the integration between, again, that physical product, the card, and the way uh, purchases and information is stored and how, me as a customer has access to that. Uh, it's it's kind of one of my, again, things that I love between physical products or physical hardware and how that, you know, is used in a digital format. So um, also, I'm Nasser was the star of my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask the opposite of that. What is your least favorite? product that you have to use regularly and it just infuriates you every single time. Hmm. <laughs> well, I would I would I think most people at the office would say this about me too. I hate email. I hate I hate Gmail. Um, I think it's like a messy product. I mean, I don't work at Google. I, I know a few people who do, but like, I'm sure that's a very difficult product to design and to develop and to like, uh, yeah, to test. Like, it's probably very difficult. Um, but like, personally, I hate email, and I think like, a lot, I think a lot of people maybe in in tech would say like Slack. Oh my God, Slack is so annoying, or Slack. Uh, but I kind of feel that way about about email. It's kind of like, you know, I, I really want to have. Uh, direct conversation with someone. And sometimes I feel like email is this antiquated chain of like, how do I find what I'm looking for? So I'd say like, yeah, Gmail is my, <laughs> I never, I never want to use that. I was not expecting that answer. Very interesting. Um, there's a question in the chat that says, are you involved with user testing in your role? Yeah, so honestly, if I, if I had a little bit more time or like if, if I, did another presentation, I would talk about how the majority of my work is based on testing and like 
I mean, I could probably find, I watched this this good lecture recently about, uh, I, th I think he was a developer, maybe a designer at Netflix, but he talks a lot about how A-B testing and like just simply putting your product out there and seeing how people use it, um, you know, changes the way you work. And I'd say like, that's the, the biggest change for me about uh, going from being a graphic designer to a digital product designer is most of my uh, choices or decisions that I make are based off of data or based off of like, you know, or based off of qualitative data and quantitative data of like, how did people use this thing? And um, like working with that to, again, A-B test and make the product better. Okay, keep going. Anybody else? Yeah, one in Texas. Okay, great. Jump on it. Oh, I thought you were stretching. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, so jumping back one more question about how you don't like email. What would you do to improve email? Um, I think, I mean, I, I'm going to be honest. I, I'm sure Google is trying to do this in a lot of ways. Like, you know, they, they there's a lot of that like predictive text that they put into into threads to make it easier to respond or or even like easier to sort and find flag things. Um, and even they have like chat, I think in in Gmail, but like. I don't really know. I don't because I like focus so much on ecom. like I'd say there's there's a, a lot of room in digital product and expertise, and I'd say all of mine is in shopping. And so like even when it comes to things like that, like I might hate it or I might like have a critique of it, but I'm definitely not. Um, I'm not one to like know what the problem is. I think that's that's the hardest part about um, solving that problem is is you really have to have a hard look at what are the goals of the business and like how do people use it and who's using it for what? Because I might not be that. I don't think I am really the target audience for Gmail anymore. I had a question. Yeah, so um, Natalie, another 2016. Um, but uh, so as a designer, you know, primarily use like InDesign, Illustrator, Photoshop. So as a product designer, what are like the tools that you mainly use? Yeah, so actually Nazar and I were talking about this before. Um, and so like in most contexts of like working at Ticktail, I, I used all the same things. I used After Effects, I used sometimes use InDesign for like exporting print files. I used a lot of Photoshop. Um, I rarely used Illustrator, but you know, quickly that core group of programs changed to me just using Sketch and Envision. And so Sketch is, is essentially how a lot of people, um, you know, develop digital products or apps, things of that sort. And Envision is kind of just a, a way to uh to prototype or like put those things in a context where people can use them and interact with them and right now we're making the switch at casper we're trying to to go from sketch to figma which is more of a collaborative i mean sketch also has a cloud version where you can collaborate but um but it's a more of a collaborative tool and when you're scaling a business like uh like a big e-commerce platform you you have to make a lot of decisions quickly and so you need to have a lot of things templatized and you need to have uh you need to have everything like that's already been designed on command and i'd say like that's the benefits of of sketch or figma is like building these huge libraries of of buttons and type styles and colors and um but yeah i'd say sketch is kind of my my number one but i i still have to do a lot of photoshop and a lot of after effects for, for the site. It's so nice to know that Adobe doesn't have a monopoly on everything. So that's <laughs> yeah. right. <laughs> Natalie, did you have a follow up question or no? no? Okay, thank I you. Think that might have been so, Kaylee. Oh, okay. there's yeah. a question in the chat. Oh, go ahead, Texas. <laughs> Sorry, this is about the tools question, so I thought I'd throw it in now. Um, what do you use for user testing at work? Um, 
So, I mean, we use Envision or we honestly use the live site and we use that through usertesting.com. And like, you know, that's qualitative research. We used to have a UX researcher on the team. So like we don't right now. And basically that role is split between us, the designers and, and the PMs who kind of develop the product roadmap. But, you know, user testing is a big one, but the, the biggest one of all is the live site. And, you know, by releasing AB tests or ABC tests, different versions of the experience and essentially using, you know, the tens of thousands of people that visit the website a day to give us information about what design is performing better and why, because, you know, you can, you can put two designs on, you know, live and a million people can look at it and that could be split and your analysis could be like non-biased and perfect, but you still don't really know you don't know anything about that person. You don't know like what needs they have about the product, like about mattresses. You don't know like, you don't know their age group. You, you know, there's different needs for different customers. And I think like having two different ways of testing of like user testing and seeing how people use things and having like an A-B test of like what was live be the like conversion aspect of it. You know, it's important to like marry those two tools together. Good question. Um, so there's a question in the chat and then we have a question in Texas. So we'll go for Texas first. And then we'll do the chat question. Yeah, so um, my question is really uh, directed towards Michael, but anyone who's been to graphic design field, I'd love to hear your input as well. I was just really um, curious because we talked about your mental health and how you worked with um, you know, multiple corporations or multiple people inside of your work environment, um, what were some good characteristics of uh, people you worked with that have really helped your um, production and um, effectiveness throughout all of your work? Yeah, this is this is a good one. Um, I mean, I can answer this briefly and then if anyone wants to chime in, definitely do so. But for me, the most important thing about being someone who doesn't know what they're doing and trying to do a lot of new things is literally clinging on to, to a mentor, someone you work with, someone you admire, because like, I honestly would be like, I would know nothing about e-commerce if it wasn't for one of my mentors, Katrina, essentially someone who I, I worked with at Ticktail, who then moved on to Casper and like convinced me to move to Casper afterwards. And I'd say like, you know, as as kind of a, a up and coming designer, you you're really like beaten down sometimes by like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't have the skills to do this. And, you know, it's it. It's not bad to lean on people, especially like if if you admire them and like not, you know, not like lean on them completely, but like, you know, lean into those relationships, build them. Um, you know, they might be people you work with, but like they can be so much more, you know, they, they, anyone can be your mentor in a sense. And so that would kind of be my best advice to like, stay positive about like what you want to do. Okay. Do you want to answer the chat question? Um, do you miss making things that don't require electricity to exist? Like the letterpress printing you made. <laughs> this is by, it sounds like somebody might have uh, some, some personal uh, <laughs> attachment to that question. <laughs> um, I do. I think like Nazra and I, since we live near each other in Brooklyn, like we always talk about like, you know, we want to do like a screen printing, uh, you know, like we want to find a, a, a local screen printer and we want to do some things like physically. And I think like one of the beauties that at least of my job is I get to work pretty closely with some of the people that design the product. And so like, even though I'm not the one like cutting foam or like doing those sorts of things, I think even just having that dialogue with people to realize like they need you to like finish the job uh, <laughs> is is fulfilling uh, in a sense. But like, yeah, the physical things, I do miss them. I do miss the letterpress and, and getting messy. <laughs> well, you're you're more than welcome to come to OU some summer day after COVID <laughs> to do <laughs> totally. <laughs> so I have a follow-up question on that, Michael. Then how long do you think before you're bored at your current job? 
because graphic designers are famous for a very low boredom threshold. And I know what New York designers are specifically. Oh yeah, New York designers move on quick. Um, I mean, I think I, I tend to be a pretty persistent person. Like once I kind of find something, I want to like crack it or I want to like until I'm done. And I think like, you know, especially being at startups or uh, I mean, now we're a public company, but like being at companies that change a lot quickly, there's a lot of turnover. People leave, your team changes, you know, quarter to quarter and you have to get used to that. And a lot of people that have left, even like my mentor, Katrina, um, she lives in Texas right now. She works at Glossier and um, she, you know, she asks me a lot, like, aren't you done there? Like, you know, aren't you ready to move on? And I think for me, I, I always kind of look at the bigger picture and it is easy to be like, I'm frustrated with this company decision or like maybe I'm bored and I don't want to sell mattresses or, or any of those things. But like, for me, I see so much potential in our growth. I mean, on, in the business sense of like what we can do, what we can deliver, but like, I think you also have to have a little bit of passion wherever you go for the brand. You know, you have to have some sort of connection to it. And I think for me, um, I mean, it's it's kind of a lame story, but like my my parents both work in furniture stores. <laughs> they they work in Ohio in a furniture store. My dad's a salesman. And so I grew up with my dad like selling mattresses and like me testing mattresses as a kid and like going to the store and jumping around on like Tempur-Pedics. And so I know that sounds lame. Like sometimes when I say that at work, like, my family's in the furniture business. We sell mattresses. Um, you know, it's not the same. It's like homegrown. My, my parents just a salesman and, and a bookkeeper. But um, I don't know. I, I have a, a lot of connection to still like that thing. I find sleep very important, even though I sometimes don't get a lot of it. Like uh, I think a lot of people love Casper too. And, and that kind of drives the passion within me, which, you know, I think is important <laughs> at the end of the day. Okay, anyone else? Oh, Allison. Okay. okay. Text. Hi. Um, so since you're working in product design and things like that, I'd like to know your personal opinion on like the new wave of minimalism that a lot of companies are embracing. Is Casper embracing it or are y'all sticking to more of your own design and your own influences? Yeah, I would say like the funny thing about Casper, like if you look at it through the lens of like uh, startup companies, you know, we there was a big boom, you know, like five, ten years ago of like everything is being sold online. Everything is direct to consumer. Everything is like, you know, I can get a, a roll of toilet paper online from a company that makes it sustainably, you know, like every single sort of product is being kind of redistributed from like those big brands that we all grew up with to like smaller brands trying to become big brands. And kind of the funny thing about Casper is like, I didn't know, even though I grew up with mattress, I didn't know anything about the mattress business when I joined Casper. I didn't even know anything about like how, how big of a startup we were. And it's funny, like, so much of our competition, because part of my job is like competitive analysis is like, uh, what does Nike do? But also like, what does Lisa or Purple, which are other mattress companies do? And a lot of, you know, one person makes a uh, direct to consumer toilet paper. All of a sudden, in a few months, there are 10 different types. And that's kind of the same story with mattresses. There's literally like so much market saturation of like, there's five, six, seven, eight different beds in a box you can get. And I think for us, it's always drive. It's like more rooted in who we are. And I think like we have a very powerful brand team or like roots in brand. And I think like a lot of people end up copying us or like copying the old Casper. And I think for us, it's always about like reflecting on our roots and like reinventing that for the, the new scale of what's to come because like there's there's so much more to us than just mattresses. And I think like um, in terms of minimalism, like I think we try to embrace like that clean, functional aesthetic. And 
it's not always what happens when marketing gets a hold of things, but like, uh, yeah, I think like in general, that is a struggle is like not to look like every other DTC company. Okay, anybody else? No, Any questions. no questions about hiring or anything? <laughs> <laughs> I think all the current students are like, how many internships do you have this summer? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we are, um, I mean, it, we are a growing company, but I would say like a lot of our uh, roles that open up tend to be in uh, software development. I mean, because being a, a tech company, um, you know, we have a lot of things to build. And I'd say like, usually anywhere you go, uh, even though there's a lot of design roles, I'd say like, when it comes to digital products, sometimes it's it's hard to find a large team unless you have a very large product or digital product like, you know, Spotify or Google has like teams and teams and teams of digital product designers working on several different digital products within their own umbrella. Mm -hmm. So we have a hand up, uh, Jesse. Again. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Michael, I'm curious about your experience. If you could talk a little bit more about moving from Ohio, from Athens mm -hmm. and what that felt like going to Brooklyn. I, I mean, I know my experience, I came to the Bay Area and it was like mind blowing for me. <laughs> and I had an internship here and also I felt like, okay, when it was done, I was like, how am I gonna stay here? Like, I can't, right. I can't go back. <laughs> so what what was that like for you? And and what was, what was some of the like, was there anything that was like surprising for you in that shift? Um, I think, I mean, I really haven't, like, before going to New York, I, I hadn't really been very many places other than Ohio, like Athens, Cleveland. Uh, I had been to, like, Las Vegas once. I had been to, like, Myrtle Beach once. But, like, you know, I, my parents don't stray very far from Ohio. And, I mean, my first experience of going to New York was with, with a group of us at school. Like, you know, a group of us went and... I mean, I remember it this way, but being like, we need to go. Like, <laughs> as a group of people, we need to go. I don't know why we need to go, but like Don always talks about New York and the people there, and we need to go. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> when I moved, like when I moved for the first time as still a junior in school and an intern, I had no clue what to expect. Like. I didn't know anything. I'd never ridden a subway. Like, you know, I didn't, there's so many things that I just hadn't done, like on my own as an individual. And, and I mean, I, I have this, this like, I stole this from my old office. I, it's like this quote. I don't know if like, you can read this. I, I guess I didn't read it. It says, I was walking this the streets. Um, I was noticed, but I wasn't the center of attention. I felt like I fit in. You're not awkward, you're not weird, you're not your home. It doesn't matter where you're from or what you believe in New York City is for everyone. And like, that's the lamest thing ever. But like, I stole this because I was like, yes, that's why I moved here because I was literally nobody. And I was everyone at the same time. Like I, I was like carving my own path. And I know that's like, whatever. But <laughs> for me, that was like powerful because uh, it's it's the one opportunity you have to like reinvent yourself of like I can be anyone and I'm sure you felt that way going to, to the Bay Area of like I get to rewrite my story essentially. Great answer, thank you. Yeah, that was beautiful. Wow, gosh. Okay, there was a question in Texas. Um, so we're all doing graphic design, but what other skill sets would you suggest with? the market nowadays that we also should adhere to learning? I mean, I, I tried to hit on this in my like little presentation, which I think like to be brief, like I probably could have said more, but I think, I mean, even like Nasr and I were, were talking about this and I, I, I was texting Alex, one of our other classmates about this before, but like, I, I truly believe like we we really got all the tools we needed. Like I might not have known anything about web design. I didn't know anything about software development. I didn't know how to code. Like I remember taking Mark's classes and being like, 
I don't know how to code. I don't understand it. I'm going to fail. Like, how will I do anything in a world that is all digital? And I guess like my my biggest takeaway there is like, you don't need to know those things. You will learn them. And you you might not think like that you want to learn them or that you even know, but like once you're in a situation where you see other people doing it, like you just start you start leeching, like even by accident of like, oh my God, I want to know this. I want to know that. And I think there's just like, there is no answer of like what you should be trying to do now. I, I think like a lot of people can say like, you should learn how to write, you know, HTML and CSS, or you should do this. And I mean, I think it's just finding, finding what makes you tick. Like for me, I, I loved typography and once I started working at TikTok, I was like, oh, they have a cool typeface. I like their brand. Um, like, this will be fun. Um, I get to animate type, you know, for ads. Oh, that's that's fun. And once I found out, like, oh, websites are books, but they move. <laughs> and, like, people use them, like, and they change. <laughs> like, that's the coolest thing ever. Like, I I think it's it's just that, like, curiosity to, to look at things differently that's gonna you know that's gonna be the best tool you can you can invest in perhaps it's uh, learning how to learn right yeah. because i think like i mean i feel like don you know everybody says this in the program of like what you're doing here is you're just learning how to to learn about what you want you mm -hmm. know what you can do, what's out there. And I think like, I mean, that's the only way I've propelled myself forward through different roles is like, I mean, even right now, like I'm, I'm constantly learning about like, you know, business things, like things that drive the business and, and even like software development because I work with so many engineers. Like, again, that empathy really plays into it of like, I might not actually do that ever. I might not actually write code but I still want to at least understand what you do with it because we can make better things together rather than separately. Well, I feel like I need to cross stitch all of these things you're saying and put them on a, on a wall. Or <laughs> <laughs> okay, where, any more questions? Uh, where would you like to be in uh, five years, Michael? In five <laughs> years? Um, I mean, I am a diehard Apple, Apple fanboy. And you know, sometimes you see like things about like Apple opening an office in New York, or I'm sure they, they have some people who do things here in New York, but I would love to work at Apple. Um, I mean, I would not want to like design for iOS or anything like that. Like that is not really my thing, but I would love to work on their website. I think that would be incredibly fun um, because they sell, you know, they sell products, complex products um, online. And I think that's like, kind of what I want to keep doing is I want to keep selling really complex products uh, or like portfolios of products online or figuring out how to do that. But in New York, right? <laughs> yeah, in New York. I mean, like I said, I, I thought about Canada at one point, but was like, no, no, but I have to drive places. No, I can't go there. Um, and so, yeah, I think New York is kind of is where I'm going to stay for a bit. I have one final question for you, Michael. Um, one thing I'd love to ask uh, successful designers is what would you do if your job did not exist? What do you think would have would attract you or keep you as interested as this? Uh, I think if honestly, if, yeah. if I didn't find e-commerce or digital product or or that I would probably be doing brand design or I would be doing animation. Um, I I love I love you know movable things. You know, I loved movable type. I feel like there's so many ways you can break something up and communicate things through, you know, deconstructing something. And I think like animation is one of those great things. You you have to send so many messages and you can do that through uh yeah, through a lot of uh ways and I think like I'd probably be an animator might not be a good one but <laughs> I'd be trying <laughs> okay we're gonna wrap things up any final questions no I think everyone's quite satisfied yeah mm -hmm. we've got some we got some good ones 
from you. Thank you so much for your advice and your very honest, uh, I guess, <laughs> take on things. I think that it's a lot of times it's hard for uh, people from smaller towns to think, oh, I could go to somewhere like New York. And uh, it's just so nice to hear a success story and that it wasn't all easy. <laughs> so yeah, we've got some applause. Totally. There. All right. Well, everybody's we've got some thank yous coming in. So um, thank you again, Michael. It's been really wonderful. And uh, we will hopefully hear from you again. And when everything opens up, we'll see you in the Don at Lita letterpress shop. Yes, you, you <laughs> definitely will see me there. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. This was great. You know, I love I love talking about this stuff. <laughs>